Good morning. My name is Chris, and I have the privilege of serving as the lead pastor here. And so thankful for Lori and the team that just continues to grow. We're all called to care for one another. We're all called to love one another, as we'll see that uh, clearly in Scripture today. Uh, but I'm so thankful that uh, Lori has just championed the care ministry here at the church and developed that in the last number of years and trying to be more and more intentional about that as we serve one another within the church and then ultimately into the community, too. So we're going to be in Romans 13 once, uh, once again. Last week, uh, I gave a sermon from the first part of Romans 13, and, and thankfully the emails were very gracious and kind, and the words were too. And, uh, and so as we talked about what it means to submit to governing authorities, what is the role uh, of, uh, of us as Christians in light of the world we live in, that our citizenship is ultimately in heaven, that we're to pray for uh, God's kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we wrapped up by looking at the last two verses that we looked at last week was seven and eight, which says this, give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So this idea of, of whatever is owed, we're as followers of Jesus to do that. As that's part of honoring God who put authorities in place. The, honoring God who is sovereign over all authorities, all systems. And in verse 8, it says, let no debt remain outstanding. So if you owe taxes, you pay those. Don't let that debt be outstanding. If you owe revenue, pay that. If someone needs respect, pay that. Honor, pay that. Why? Well, Paul knows, and we know too, that debt has power. Power over us and power over others. Debt controls us. Debt consumes us. Debt impacts choices that we can and can't make. Debt impacts the options that we have in life and around us, and debt impacts relationships. Question for you this morning. Does anyone have 50 bucks I can borrow? You bring cash with you? All right. Wow, so many volunteers. I'll take everyone's cash. <laughs> so I'm going to come this way. I saw a hand here. So where's the hand? Kelsey? Kelsey? Andrew? Really want 50 bucks. If you have 50 bucks, yeah. I don't really have 50 bucks. You don't have 50 bucks? <laughs> Hundred. Well, that's what I was wondering. I was like, is this fake? This may be fake. I'm not really sure. So, a hundred bucks. I don't see this very often. It is hundred bucks. Thank you. That's wonderful. All right. So, Paul teaches us that there is a debt that is okay. And that debt is love. I mean, he says it right here, right? Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. So we just heard this a minute ago. The commandments, this is how we fulfill the law. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Uh, and whatever other commands there may be, they're all summed up in one command. To love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm of a neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law, Right? So here's scripture. Paul is teaching this. Question for you. How many of you are still thinking about the $100 that are in my pocket? Thank you for your honesty. Yep. Yep. See, I just read scripture. I started to move on, but some of you, many of you are like, what's he going to do with that 100 bucks? He just took 100 bucks from Dennis. See, you've been impacted by the debt that I have to Dennis. I've been impacted by the debt that I have to Dennis. So there's this outstanding debt that's there. So what if I go home later and I'm taking my keys out of my pocket and I'm like, oh, whoops, I forgot about that. It impacts the relationship. I'm like, okay, I have to pay Dennis back. Or tomorrow I wake up when I get my keys out of that same drawer and I'm like, oh, I got to pay Dennis back. So say we fast forward a month and I still haven't paid him back. And I run into Dennis at Meyer, and I'm shopping along and I'm like, oh, Dennis is at the other end of the aisle which is my typical reaction when I see Dennis anyways. And, <laughs> and Dennis may come up and just start talking to me, like everything is fine, wonderful, hey, how's the family, you know, what's going on? And he may have even forgotten about the $100 that I borrowed from him. But what am I doing? I'm going like, oh, no. I'm answering questions, having a conversation, but all I can see is like the $100 filtering that conversation. And he may leave, and I'm like, oh, man, I stole him the money. It's impacting the relationship. That's the negative side of it. But Paul is also talking, and there's a positive side. And he says there's one debt that is okay to have, 
one of that is, is love. What if in that same way, when I saw you or, or you saw someone else at Meyer or out in the community or at school or wherever you're going, that you have that, that, that thing just flashing in your mind, ooh, I owe them a debt of love. Oh, there's a debt. What can I do to love them? Because I owe them love. As a follower of Christ, it has nothing to do whether or not they did something to me. As a follower of Christ, I owe a debt of love to others. What if I operated in that same way? And as Paul said in verse 9, he said, hey, the commandments are a great way to start to live this out. This is how we love one another. Don't commit adultery. So don't commit adultery with your neighbor's spouse. You shall not murder. Great way to love someone is not murder them. Hopefully you knew that. You shall not steal. In fact, so I don't have to like feel guilty about this. I'm not going to steal from you, Dennis. As tempting as it, Drew is willing to steal from you. There's, that's a really complicated reality right there uh, with Drew stealing there. Um, I love how the laughter like trickled as you slowly like got that comment there. Some of you are still wondering what in the word, never mind. Never mind. All right, anyways, uh, not to be jealous. That's another way to love your neighbor because jealousy impacts relationship. Like you may look at them and be like, oh, I wish I had their whatever or this reality. He says these are ways to love. And it's not just not violating God's commands. It's also being proactive and looking for ways to bless neighbor. Well, scripture uses the word neighbor often, is, you know, love your neighbor. But who is your neighbor? Well, Jesus had that question posed to him as an expert of the law came and said, who is my neighbor? You're telling me to love my neighbor. Who is my neighbor? Because there's all these people that I don't really like, and I don't live near them. Uh, I don't really interact with them. I don't really have anything to do with them. Can they not be my neighbor? And then all these people, let's have them be my neighbor. So Jesus tells a story, he tells a parable, these great stories of the Good Samaritan. He tells of a man who's attacked, and then a priest walks by, and the priest should have helped him, but he didn't. The Levite walks by and should have helped him, but he didn't. And then a Samaritan, to those who heard the story, would be repulsed by the fact that a Samaritan would even be in the story. The Samaritan is the enemy, and Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero. The Samaritan takes pity and goes to the person who is hurt and cares for him. And then Jesus asks this question. He says, who was the neighbor to the man? Not who is your neighbor. Who was the neighbor? This proactive reality. Not just to ask who is my neighbor, but to be a neighbor. To look for people to neighbor toward. Jesus says, the one who had mercy. And so Jesus says, go and do likewise. So the question we ask, that Paul is asking us to ask, when we live out all the theology that he's already taught, when we live it out as citizens here, ultimately citizens of heaven, is we have to ask the question, what does love require of me? What does love require of me? But so often our realities, our perspectives are so clouded with so many other things, which we'll get to in just a moment, that we fail to even ask this question. We fail to acknowledge the debt of love that we have towards other human beings because we're so consumed with things between us. Paul, in another passage of Scripture, he uses 1 Corinthians 13, and he says, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects. It always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And this is far beyond just a marriage reality. I mean, this passage is used at wedding ceremonies all the time, but that's not what Paul intended. Yes, to have these things in your marriage, but this overflows into every relationship, this debt of love. Am I patient with others? Am I kind? Am I envying? Am I boasting? Am I proud? This whole list. And the reality is, is that none of us are perfect, but we seek to follow in these ways. We seek this way to love one another. And Paul said in Galatians 6, he said, carry each other's burdens. I mean, what if we walk that way? Like, this is the perspective that I have of how to love another person, is to carry someone else's burdens. Maybe that's a spouse. 
Maybe that's a child. Maybe that's a neighbor. Maybe that's a, a parent. Maybe that's someone at school or at work. Carry each other's burdens. Every human being has burdens. Every single one. Can we see clear enough to ask that question, what does love require of me? How can I help with this burden? He says, and this is the way that we fulfill the law of Christ. Paul's saying, love neighbor. And in verse 11, he says, and do this. Why? Well, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Paul's saying, wake up. It's easy to go through the motions in life. It's easy to take moments and days for granted. When I think of sleep, like ideal sleep, just think of like this most comfortable position, this super comfortable pillow, you know, blankets, warm, comfortable, and just peace and stillness. That's ideal, right? But the reality is, is that many sleep in different ways. Many of you talk in your sleep. Many of you hear things in your sleep. Many, uh, or some of you may sleepwalk. Some of you may sing. And as I said that this morning, I thought of when I was in high school and I sang, you remember the old song by TLC, Waterfalls? <laughs> I sang that in my sleep when I was in high school. My buddies were like, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I don't remember. Obviously, that was on my mind for some reason. But the thing is, is like that situation, I didn't remember it. You may not remember talking in your sleep. You may not remember sleepwalking. You may remember a part of a dream, but there's this fogginess. There's this reality. But others around you can see you do these things or hear you do these things. Spiritually, it can be the same reality. Is we can walk in this sleepiness that what Paul's getting at. For example, the songs that we sang earlier, what were the main messages of those songs? What was the core message of any of the songs? What did you read yesterday in Scripture? What, if I were to ask you right now and put a mic in your face and say, tell me one thing that God has done for you this weekend, would you be able to do that? And for many, it'd be like, oh, 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 what was that song? We sang some song, of Jesus, something about Jesus in that song. I, I, know, I know it was in there somewhere. Why? Because we, we kind of sleepwalk. This is not guilt or anything or shame. It's just a reality. We, we sleepwalk a lot when it comes to things of God. Many of us will leave here, and then if we you know, think back this afternoon, we're like, Chris talked about something. He's been in Romans for like a year, so it had to be from Romans. I'm sure he said something about Jesus. But we do this. And Paul is saying, wake up, be alert, pay attention to what God is trying to do, how God is trying to speak. How God is working in us so he can work through us. And in verse 12, he says, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. He's saying, salvation is almost here. You're like, well, I'm saved. All right, awesome, great. So often we think of salvation as a static moment. I prayed a prayer. I had a salvation experience. That is awesome. That is great. That's good to be able to point to that. But what has happened since? Because salvation is not just a static moment. It is not just a prayer. It is not just a confession. It's important. But what is Jesus doing? What has he done in your life? What is his spirit doing? Because scripture speaks of salvation in three different ways. Is one, we are saved. We're saved. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. So you are saved. If you've confessed Jesus as your, your Lord and Savior, if you've, been, if you've received his grace, his forgiveness, you are saved. But you're also being saved. The cross is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1 says, For the the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, who do not know Jesus. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You're being saved, experiencing the power of God, actively living this out, the salvation. 
But third, you also will be saved. See, because of Jesus, we're justified. We're made right. We're secure in his sight. But because of Jesus, we're going to be saved from the wrath of God. Romans 5, 9 says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, made right, because of what Jesus said on the cross, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So there is this saving yet to come. And we trust Jesus for all of it. That we are saved, that we're being saved, and that we will be saved. And in Romans 13, verse 12, he he says, So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So in this salvation that has been done, that is being done and will be done, we put aside the deeds of darkness. This is another way for him to say sin. And he says, not only do we put aside the deeds of darkness, sin, but we put on the armor of light. And he's going to point to Jesus in just a moment in this. But darkness is a metaphor for sin. Darkness is a hiddenness for shame. I mean, so much sin that we have committed, that others commit, is, is done in darkness or alone. Maybe it's darkness of night. Maybe it is being alone, like no one's around me, no one sees us. I'm hidden here. Multiple places in Scripture, it says, like Ephesians 4, it says, you were taught in regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds, to put on a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. In Colossians, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on a new self which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of the creator. James 1 says, get rid of all moral filth that is, and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. First Peter, rid yourself of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. So these are attitudes of the heart and uh, attitudes within us and our mind, actions that come out of that. And then Paul, he, he gives examples of deeds of darkness in this passage. He says in verse 13, let us behave decently as in the daytime, as if everything is just exposed, like everyone can see what I'm doing, that I'm not hidden in a space, I'm not hidden by darkness. He says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. And so he says, put aside these sins. And the word carousing that he uses is the Greek word komos, which simply means partying. That is the most raw way that he says it. Just put aside partying. And then he names two things that can so often be connected with partying. First, he says drunkenness. Now, Scripture does not forbid alcohol. For as much as your tradition that you may have grown up in forbids it, Scripture does not forbid it. The Old Testament multiple times speaks to alcohol as being a blessing and a gift. However, what Scripture is very clear about is that drunkenness is a sin. Being drunk. There's no need for a Jesus follower to be intoxicated. It's poor witness to Christ. It's poor witness to you. It's poor witness to the church. He says, put this aside. It's a deed of darkness. And then he says sexual immorality. What is sexual immorality? Sexual immorality is sexual activity outside of marriage. So the one night stand, just hooking up, uh, someone you're dating, someone you're engaged to. Why does he say sexual immorality? Why why is it contained within marriage? Because it's bad? Not at all. Sex is a gift. It is a massive gift from God. It is a loving act. It is a blessing. It is a connection point for two human beings. But why is it contained within marriage? Well, it is the greatest container for the powerful, life-changing, the commitment, the the, the covenant reality of marriage is this container. Because it's so powerful, here is this container, this gift that God has given, this intention that he has. And he says debauchery, which is essentially excessive indulgence. So it can be drunkenness, it could be drug use, it could be sexual immorality, but it extends to pornography. Um, certain places that uh, really sell any sort of lustful sexual realities. 
uh, lust in the heart of the mind, even unhealthy emotional relationships can be put into this reality. He names dissension, quarreling, fighting, being the source of division, being the source of pain for others. Jealousy. He names these things and he says, put these aside. Flee from these deeds of darkness. And this concept of fleeing is is found in Scripture too. We must flee temptation. Now, temptation is not a sin. If you're tempted in any of these ways or any other way, temptation is not a sin. Why not? Well, Jesus was tempted and Jesus was without sin. So we must flee from temptation. Every single one of us, every single day, are tempted in some way, tempted to sin. So in specifically what Paul's talking about, if you're tempted to party, this may seem simplistic, but I'm just going to speak it, is don't go. Find different friends. Get a hobby. Join some sort of other group or start some other sort of group. Go to youth group. Do something. If you're tempted to get drunk, don't go to the bar. Pour out your secret stash. Don't drink. Choose a different kind of drink. Ask someone to hold you accountable. If you cannot stop, Admit you have a drinking problem and get help. Ask. If you're tempted to or you're having sex outside of marriage, keep yourself from the situation where that happens. When you're alone with that person, find something to do. Go somewhere else. Have the conversation with the other person. If necessary, break up with the person. Ask someone to hold you accountable. If you're tempted to lust, stop going places. Redirect your eyes. Get away from that person. Stop visiting him. Stop texting him. Get rid of the app, the website, the subscription. Do whatever it is. Flee. Now, we sin. We do these things. Paul is not surprised by these things. We look back at, you know, Scripture and like, oh, they they don't understand what we're going through. No, they do. Like, and the reality of sin is the same. See, we sin. They sinned in Rome excessively like we do in our country. We sin with the hope that it will Heal us. Now, that sounds silly, right? Like sin to heal us? But we sin hoping it will heal us. We have, we're lonely, we're bored, we're sad, we're empty, we're hurt. Whatever it may be, we sin to fill that in. Helps us feel more comfortable in a situation. Helps us in whatever relationship. And the reality is, is that in that moment, it's good. Let's be honest. Those things, like in the moment, they're good. And that's often what we just look at is the moment. But then there's the next morning. You're like, oh. Or five minutes later, oh, what did I do? Okay, I'm not going to do it again. But then it happens again and again. See, the reason we do anything in life is to avoid pain or to gain pleasure. Think about it. This reason you choose whatever it is is to avoid pain or to gain pleasure. See, we like to play with sin. We like to flirt with sin. We like to think about sin. We like to flirt with sin. But that's dangerous. And it gets us into all sorts of situations. But I want to tell you this morning is that God always gives us a way out. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote these words. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Like I can go like right here. and I'm good. He says this, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. What he's saying is that, hey, that temptation you're dealing with, someone else in this room is dealing with that same temptation. It's common. You may be going like, well, Chris, you don't know. Someone else is dealing with that. See, the lie of the enemy is that, like, you're the only one dealing with whatever it is. So instead of confessing that, admitting that, you withdraw. I'm all alone. I mean, if anyone finds out about this, oh, mm, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose that relationship. And so what do we do? We just go back further and further out of the light going to find the darkness, and I'm going to stay here. And then there's just a cycle of destruction within us. I'm all alone. No one knows what it's like. Can't come into the light. 
I'm just stuck. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is what? He's faithful. God is faithful. God is there. God is present. Whether you're here in the light or you're hiding back here, God is faithful. The choices that you made last night or 10 years ago or whatever, God is still faithful. God sees you, knows you, is willing to forgive you. He continues by saying, he's not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. So every temptation that comes, there is a way out. That's what he says. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. I think if you look back at temptations and those times that you have either escaped sin or you've given into sin, there was a way out. You didn't want it or it was hard or it didn't seem convenient or whatever. There's a way out. What Paul is saying is we will all be tempted as human beings, but there's always a way out because God is faithful. But he's going to let you make a choice. He's going to let me make a choice. And I love how this verse ends. He said he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. There may not be this complete removal of that temptation. There may not be this complete healing of whatever that is. There may be endurance because, like me, you've been there. You've confessed something. I confess the sin and I keep this temptation from me. And then the temptation goes, bloop, back. I can give in or I can endure. Again, God is faithful. He is present. He is giving that way out. And so what Paul is saying is we take off the deeds of darkness. We name things for what they are, sin. Call sin what it is. Put on the armor of light. Verse 14 says this, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. A couple of weeks ago, you may remember that we were talking about being clothed and the option of it. And, and what I asked was, how many of you this morning just woke up and you're like, clothes! And the clothes just jumped right on you. No one then, and I'm guessing still today, that didn't happen. Right? You choose to be clothed. You choose your clothing, someone in your household chooses your clothing, whatever that may be. But there's a choice. And so again in verse 14, it says, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a choice. And he says, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. It's a choice. We put on Jesus. And we choose not to think about the gratification of the flesh. Because guess what? You're human, I'm human. And the flesh wants things. So is Paul getting at this because he's just looking for good, upright Christians who are moral and say and do all the right things? No, that's not the end goal. And many of us grew up feeling like morality is just the, the thing. It's just don't sin. Be, be a good Christian. Like that was the end. And then someday we would go to heaven. That was the win. But that just left me and many of you going like, oh, is that it? Like, heaven's good. That's great. But what about now? it has got to be something more. There's, it can't just be this waiting game. See, when we choose the deeds of darkness, it is an idol. It is idolatry. We don't use that word very much in our culture. But what it is, is it, it's something between us and God, and it is something between us and neighbor. Because when I am giving in to the deeds of darkness, when I am walking in that, I'm hiding, I'm alone, or I'm covered in shame, I'm not good enough, I can't help anyone else. I can't, I can't pray with them. I can't go to that Bible study. I can't go to that group. I can't, I can't serve them. I, like, I feel like a hypocrite. Because there's this idol clouding our vision. There is this broken reality between us. See, we put on Christ and we put off deeds of darkness to love our neighbor and to build and invest in the things that last. God himself, truth, love, righteousness. And I want to encourage us too is that we all have this temptation. We look at 
the current situation and we look at the choice we have. And it's like, oh, that temptation feels and sounds good. Because this is going to happen, whether it's today or tomorrow or this weekend or whatever. Like, I can give in to this and I can find the pleasure in the flesh. Or I can put on Jesus and have a longer term perspective. Because often what happens is we choose this and then this starts to bring about a trail of destruction. And it may be something really small that no one knows about. It starts to add up. The choices we have, what do we do with this? Putting on Jesus and putting off the deeds of darkness. I want to encourage you to invest in the future. No matter where you've been, what you've done today, now, right now, to invest in the future. When we wrap up, I'm going to give an opportunity for you to confess whatever before God. I encourage you to confess it in today to start. And then guess what? That temptation is going to come. It'll be back. I promise you. But you put on Christ. I want to close by telling you about Augustine. Augustine was born in 356 AD in North Africa, and he became the Bishop of Hippo, which is uh, modern-day Algeria. And he is considered to be the most influential Christian after Jesus. Well, I mean, Jesus is Jesus. but um, And after Paul. Augustine. And he lived decades in bondage to sin, specifically sexual sin. And he wrote this in his book, Confessions, which is this outpouring of his heart to God. He said, as I grew to manhood, I was inflamed with his desire for an excess of hell's pleasure. So he's talking about when he was about 16 years old. I went to Carthage where I found myself in the midst of a hissing cauldron of lust. And he lived there for about 15 years. My real need was for you, my God, who are the food of my soul, and I was not aware of this hunger. So about 30, 31, he moved to Milan, Italy. And he developed a friendship with a pastor named Ambrose and had a really good friend that he spent a lot of time with. He sat in the garden one day with his friend talking about the impossibility of purity, specifically sexual purity. He just felt overwhelmed with the control that that had on his life. And he said this, there was a small garden attached to the house where I was lodged, and I now found myself driven by the tumult in my breast to take refuge in this garden where no one could interrupt that fierce struggle in which I was my own contestant. I was beside myself with madness that would bring me sanity. I was dying a death that would bring me life. I was frantic, overcome by violent anger with myself for not accepting your will and entering into your covenant. I tore my hair. I hammered my, fists with, or my forehead with my fist. I locked my fingers and hugged my knee. Can you picture him in this garden, just struggling between the temptation and the sin that had so consumed his life and knowing what God wanted for him and had planned for him? The battle continued, and he says, I was held back by mere trifles. They plucked at my garment of flesh and whispered, are you going to dismiss us? From this moment, we shall never be with you again forever and ever. It's like this taunting voice of like, are you sure you can really give this thing up? Are you sure you want to give this thing up? You know it's just going to be there again and again and again. Are you, you're going to give in again. Here as he continued. He said, and while I stood trembling at the barrier, on the other side I could see chaste beauty. The beauty and consonance and all her serene, unsullied joy as she modestly beckoned me to cross over and to hesitate no more. She stretched out loving hands to welcome me and embrace me. And what he was describing was this reality of purity, this reality of putting on the armor of light, the reality of freedom, of victory, of hope, this welcome to purity. He said, I flung myself down beneath a fig tree and gave way to the tears which now streamed from my eyes. In my misery, I kept crying, how long will I go on saying tomorrow, tomorrow? Why not now? Why not make the end to my ugly sins at this moment? All at once, I heard the sing-song voice of a child in a nearby house. Whether it was a voice of a boy or a girl, I cannot say. But again and again, it repeated the refrain, take it and read, take it and read. At this, I looked up, thinking hard whether there was any kind of game in which children used to chant these words like these. But I could not remember ever hearing them before. I stemmed my flood of tears and stood up, telling myself that this could only be a divine command to open my book of Scripture and read the first passage which my eyes should fall. 
So I hurried back, opened Paul's epistles, and in silence, I read the first passage on which my eyes fell, Romans 13, 13 and 14. Not in reveling and drunkenness, not in lust and wantonness, not in quarrels and rivalries, rather arm yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Spend no more thought on nature and nature's appetites. He continued by saying, I had no wish to read more, nor need to do so. For in an instant, as I came to the end of the sentence, it was as the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. And in that moment, Augustine was forever transformed. And maybe there's something that just has that control like it had control on Augustine so long ago. Maybe it's something Paul listed in this passage. Maybe it's something else. But I want to tell you there is hope, there is future, there is victory, there is freedom. And so maybe for you today, that thing just keeps coming to the mind, your mind, that thing or things. Maybe like Augustine, the Spirit of God working in your heart as you hear the words that Paul wrote so long ago, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, rather clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you Lord, that you always give us a way out. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that in the midst of temptation, you are there. Jesus, I thank you that you went to the cross to die for all sin, all of our sin, every single one, including that one that maybe someone here is thinking, Jesus, you couldn't have died for that. Jesus, you took it all upon yourself because you wanted relationship with us. And Lord, you call us to confess. And so just in the stillness of these next moments, I want to encourage you or invite you. And if God has just been tapping on your shoulder or, or as it was said earlier, like with Drew just being slapped upside the head, just, just take this moment to confess that to God to ask and receive forgiveness. Would you take a moment? Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have heard the confession in this place. Lord, you have forgiven. God, and you forgive. And I want to pray for the person here today that's hearing this and maybe even just confess something that have never received you as Lord and Savior. Really the starting point of relationship, as I said earlier. That today, that they would confess to you too as I am a sinner. God, I am in need of a Savior and today, I trust Jesus as my Savior. I confess my sin. I receive your forgiveness. Lord, I want to today begin to walk in your way. Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. And Father, I thank you that you know us, you love us, you pursue us, and you don't want to leave us in the places that we find ourselves. Thank you for rescuing us. God, I pray that you would continue to transform us individually. And God, may we overflow with love to our neighbor. That we would be able to clearly see that debt of love we get to give to our neighbor. And so Jesus, we surrender this and we continue to surrender this in your name. Amen.